want to welcome everybody to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'll be uh, relatively quiet tonight, but I'm the host of EdChat Interactive. And tonight we're having featured speakers, John Fallon and Paul Darvasi. Uh, they're both uh, avid gamers, uh, incredible teachers, and featured speakers at the Serious Play Conference. And many of you came uh, it, through the auspices of the Serious Play Conference also. I have to say that's a really interesting conference. This year, it's going to be online instead of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, the last couple of years it's been in Orlando. And um, that's a great way of, of cross-pollinating games across uh, education, fun, social good, corporate, military, government, and research. So um, all you should check out the Serious Play Conference if you haven't and take a look at registering for some of the events there. But I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it over to Paul and John uh, and let each one of you, the two of you, in introduce yourselves and um, maybe talk a little bit about how you use games and um, let's start the conversation going. Actually, you know something? Let me add one more thing. We want to make this a conversation. So there's a chat. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage all of you to chat. Also, I'd encourage all of you, if you have a question and you want to pop up and ask it or get into a conversation, to uh, post something in the chat to say you'd like to come up and we'll bring you up and uh, unmute you and let you be part of the conversation because uh, I think that we all learn better when, we, when it's social and, and we interact. So. Mm -hmm. Um, John and Paul, um, let me let me be quiet and let you go. Oh, why don't you start first? Hmm. Sure. Uh, my name is Paul Darvazi, and I'm a high school media studies and English teacher based in Toronto, Canada. Um, and I've been teaching for about 20 years and have been using games uh, fairly steadily in my practice for the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, I've both designed alternate reality games. One of them I designed with John. Uh, we actually met through a shared interest in, all, in alt alternate reality games. And we've both uh, integrated commercial video games in our classes as well. So we've done a lot of work around games, both collaboratively, individually, um, and we're very passionate about it. And we hope to share some of our experiences and learn from you as well today. Hi, right, uh, I'm John Fallon. I've been teaching uh, English uh, at the middle school and high school level for the last 11 years. Uh, I'm based out of Fairfield, Connecticut, and I teach at an all-boys uh, high school. I've been using games for probably the last uh, almost 10 years, uh, and as Paul said, uh, done work on alternate reality games and turning the classroom space and the online space into a game itself uh, to leverage for learning. Uh, and I also uh, make use of uh, video games in the classroom to use as texts and study them as texts and learn from them as texts uh, and build the same skills as you would with traditional media like literature uh, or uh, movies. Great. Do you guys want to hear how John and I met? It's such a good story. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> we, um, so uh, when I, I created my first uh, alternate reality game, I think it was like 2012, 2011, something like that. And it was based around Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And, and it, I didn't even know what an alternate reality game was at the time. My, my whole sort of vision was to externalize a video game to be played in real life. Uh, that seed had been planted in me some years before in an article that I read. And I thought, wow, how does that look? How do you play a video game in real life? And then through a long series of circumstances, I, I came up with a, this idea of turning my school into the asylum depicted in the novel and making my students patients. And it was a lot of fun. And, and, and it felt like a fairly original experience. I thought I had this very unique experience that I wanted to share. So I ended up going to a conference convinced that I would be the only person who has anything like this to bring to the table. Of course, it was a small, beautiful conference in upstate New York called the, the um, Games and Education Symposium. And, uh, and one of the first people that I meet while I'm, uh, we're, we're, we're loading the shuttle bus is John. Uh, and we start talking and it turns out that John also created an alternate reality game. So we immediately became uh, mutually fascinated and, uh, and spent many, many, many hours over many years working on many projects together.
yeah, that, 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 that's about it. Uh, does anyone have any questions uh, before we kind of dive into anything else? So one of, the, one of the questions that like hits me is what games are your students using this year? Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so my students are going to be using two games this year. Uh, in the fall, uh, I make use of a game called Her Story, which is a kind of an interactive police procedural where you're kind of diving through a frag, relatively simple game to play, but students still need training to how to successfully navigate the virtual space and how to play the game. So never, never take for granted that just because you put a, a video game in front of, you know, 21st century students that they're instantly going to know what to do because that's almost never the case. Yeah, I agree. And interactive fiction is hit and miss, right? It's a, it's an unusual medium. I wouldn't quite class it. Some of them are very game like, um, but when I do the unit with my students, I use um, Gradecraft, which is which is um, a kind of an LMS, a gamified LMS that was developed, or a game full actually LMS that was de that was developed at the University of Michigan. And I, I don't use it for the whole year, but I do use it in the last one because it allows you to create kind of a branching, unlocking task structure so that the kids can you know finish a task and unlock, and they can kind of follow their own learning path. And I thought it was a really interesting way to marry form and content because. We're we're learning about branching narratives and they kind of have a branching structure in the way that they access the material that they're learning from or and part of that is they have a whole slew of, of text adventures and interactive fiction to choose from and a lot of them they don't like they, they either find them too hard um, the puzzles are too challenging and there's a few that they love because they're pretty simple and clean to get through and some kids who love puzzles like the ones with puzzles so that's more hit and miss but because they have a lot of choice and they're usually over pretty quickly um, even if they haven't had a positive experience they, they they tend to just move on to the next one and eventually find a game that they enjoy or a, a story actually that they enjoy. I see a question about um, someone at the elementary school level because uh, a lot of the game-based learning is, is targeted toward probably our age group at the high school level uh, or the middle school level. Do you know any resources off the top of your head? Uh, I, I see Steve recommended Minecraft, uh, no mm -hmm. surprise, and I would agree with that. Um, my other thought would be, would be uh, like a very short form alternate reality game. What do you think? Oh yeah, that, that's even better for middle school than high school. They're so jaded in high school that your alternate reality game better be super edgy <laughs> for, to get them engaged, to pull them away from all their other misdemeanors. Yeah. But, uh, but middle school, is a, I think it's the sweet spot for running because they're especially kind of the grade five, grade six zone is perfect, even though it's a little pre-middle school. But the, you can really draw them into the narrative. You can draw them into the fantasy. And I think that a lot can be done. Mike Matera does a lot of great work with that age group. And he's one of the guys that runs amazing ARGs and does, has done, you know, he's published a book called Explore Like a Pirate, whose title doesn't actually tell you what the book's about, which is all these amazing resources to run an ARG and very much geared uh, for the middle school audience. So I, I would recommend that for sure. And I just put into, into the chat, uh, Ryan Schaff has composed a free ebook on digital games and a lot of them are geared to towards elementary school and he's yeah. actually going to be on here he and his compatriot carrie are going to be on here in about a month but yeah uh, ryan's but, great ryan does a lot of interesting stuff in this space well he's not as great as you are oh yes he is by a long <laughs> shot <laughs> not as handsome yeah well <laughs> so we'd like to think um any other questions so I um, so I had another question, which is: Are some games better for engaging students, engaging students when you all can't be in the same room? Like mm. Um, mm. when you're uh, let's let's say for some strange reason that there was some virus and it <laughs> it, re it closed, you know, all schools in the community. So what you know, are games are some games better for that? Um, well, certainly, if, if you're one of those teachers who uses an online space like World of Warcraft or an MMO or some type or a Minecraft server, that's, that's certainly going to be like your first easiest entry point because you, get, you have the virtual space where you can interact and as long as everyone has the relevant software and internet connection, you're in. Uh, but, you know, that, that certainly requires probably setting it up beforehand or at least a lot of organization online um i don't know what do you think paul 
Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a variety of ways to look at that. First of all, there are games that are absolutely best played individually. Uh, another game that I've used in in my classes for years is a game called Gone Home. Uh, we were on a on a uh, basically streaming a, a book club around Gone Home earlier today with Steve Isaacs, who's here, and Mike Washburn, who's here. And, um, and that game I really feel has to be played individually. So in terms of online play, I, I would suggest that in that particular case, kids should have their own copies. And there's games that really, because they're so personal to your desires and your choices, that I think that those have to be played on an individual level. And, and if there's a budget or, or the games are available for free, then that's plausible. There are games like Edith Finch, for example, that I think can be played collectively, where, where it's, it's a, the narrative is a little bit more railroaded. There's, a, there's, a, there's less choices, to, there's fewer rather choices to be made. And, and as a result of that, uh, you, you know, I, every year I play Edith Finch, I just have one copy and I project it on the screen and it works beautifully. So I would imagine a game like that, which Sean Clybor and John uh, will be doing shortly, can, I, I, Sean's already started, uh, works much better um, in an online format. So I think you have on one hand the multiplayer games where you can have your whole class meet in a virtual world. Um, might, must be a little bit like herding cats depending on the situation. The other, uh, the other option is having a game where you can you know, somehow broadcast or stream the gameplay and the students can, can tune in, hopefully create some system where they can contribute to the gameplay, although that can be tough. And then finally to just distribute copies to the individual students they play on their own and then you can meet online and discuss where they are and what they're doing yeah so i'm about starting next week i will be uh launching what remains of edith finch and playing it via mixer uh through my xbox so uh mixer is like the the microsoft version of twitch and all it requires is a link to send out to students and then press a button on my uh my xbox and i can stream uh playing the game to all my students who, who will have that link ahead of time so theoretically, it should work. I mean, emphasis on theoretically, because it's, it's definitely going to be uncharted territory, but I'm hoping that there's enough interactivity through the chat and through the other elements on Mixer that uh, students will feel engaged, uh, uh, you know, watching, you know, certain segments of the game as we play through it uh, together over streaming. Another, another I, I should add this just because it is something we are doing online. Um, one of the things we're worried about at my school is the sense of connection being lost through online learning. So the, that sense of, you know, when you're face to face with students, when you're engaging with them in the hallways, um, uh, it's, it's one of the great things about my school is that we really value those connections. And, and I, like John, I teach all boys and boys really need those relationships for them to trust you. And those relationships are really important. And we pride ourselves on those. So we were really, you know, we're very concerned about the current situation because we try to be, you know, close and, and there, but uh, the fact that we're all separated has certainly impaired our ability to, to, to pursue those relationships in the way that we traditionally would. So one thing uh, that I thought would be an interesting idea is to create a game uh, that we can play using uh, social mechanics. So um, I'm, I'm petrified because I'm about to jump into this in a week and I have not put the type the uh, amount of preparation I normally would before we do this type of game, but I have some student collaborators and we're going to launch this thing. It's gonna be a little bit unexpected in the style of an ARG and we're largely drawing from archival material at our school to create a series of puzzles and, and, and kind of, uh, and, and trying to create uh, activities and events that will draw students together who would normally not mix. So in order to solve a certain puzzle, you've got to show up at a Google Meet at a certain place at a certain time and draw information and maybe work together to find out information from each other. Um, because what we're finding is that the kids are have kind of uh, receded into their social silos where they've got their, you know, their friends that they game with and they talk with, but they're not mixing much amongst themselves the way that they would at school. So I think that the objective of this game is, and, and the, the reason it, it's a little scary is that normally my games are tied to marks and that is a fairly uh, good way to motivate students to do things. So now we're going in without a net and this is entirely voluntary. So it's, uh, it's a little bit scary to think that nobody's gonna sign up for our game or nobody's gonna jump on board once we try to hook them in. So that's another, another type of game you could deliver online and, and with planning and design, I'm sure that something spectacular uh, could be done. Yeah, my school has actually been doing to uh, try, try to keep that community alive that Paul uh, mentioned is they've been doing uh, like an amazing race done uh, virtually 
where you know you're you're solving clues and rushing and and once you figure out the right link it brings you to a certain zoom person who gives you the next clue uh and it's ours has been uh revolving around like school culture and things like that uh and it's been a hit so if you kind of can put together a virtual amazing race and just have you bouncing around different uh zoom uh sessions that uh that the teachers are already uh collabor collaborating with you to to be ready for uh that can be a lot of fun as well and do you have any a link or do you have materials for that? Uh, I wasn't involved in it myself. Uh, so uh, I can try to see if, if there's been uh, some recording of materials and, and the process, uh, whether it's a public or I can just ask the person who organized it. Uh, I, I can see if I can track that down. One, one piece of software, if you want to do something like that really easily, there's, a, there's something called Goose Chase that allows you to create online kind of treasure hunts and scavenger hunts, and it gives you lots of different tools and puzzles and activities. So if you want to create kind of a smaller scale online activity to motivate your students, Goose Chase is probably a really easy way for you to just kind of, you know, use the, the, the resources that they share with you in order to set that up. Have either of you tried the uh, world climate simulation from the United Nations? I have not, no. Have you heard of no. it? No. So I, I just, um, I'd heard about it and then I attended a webinar on it this, this week. And I, I, I actually am thinking of getting our Facebook group, you know, um, together to, to try it out. But it's not a video game. I'll, I'll put the link here in the, mm -hmm. in the chat. Um, it's, but it, but it can be played, you know, over something like, like Zoom. So, so you form the, the kids form teams of, um, and there can be uh, either three or six teams, and then they negotiate how they're going to, um, what their countries are going to do to uh, combat climate change and decrease emissions and based on what they agree to do that goes into a you know the the dungeon master or whatever they, they call the the master person puts it into a model and it shows how much it's going to actually reduce emissions and how much it's going to reduce um temperature and then the kids go back into their groups and then they renegotiate and people from one group can attend a different country because the wealthy countries can pay the uh the developing countries to put more resources in um and then you can have other kids um or adults who are lobbyists who go in and some lobbyists will be environmental lobbyists but some lobbyists will represent things like the oil industry that's trying to discourage you from uh, going to clean energy and it's it, it just seemed to me to be a really interesting game um, getting kids to work in groups, um, plan, collaborate, understand climate change, understand math um, and graphics. Um, and it's designed for, I think, middle school through adults. Mm. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, th those games are incredibly effective. Um, I, I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to participate in a simulation. Um, and it's a it's, it's based around a uh, software that iThrive is currently developing that facilitates the use of, of elaborate role play simulations. It's really awesome. I was really impressed by it. And in this particular one, uh, we, we did it over Zoom. Uh, there were about 25 of us and it was, it was essentially a political crisis in the States. Everybody had roles, everything from you know, the, the, you know, the person who's in charge of the staff and the press secretary and all, all these kind of Washington roles. And what was fascinating, role play is so powerful because you know, once you're given your role and your identity, people really invest themselves in it. And, and even in a format like this, we were in exactly this kind of arrangement with a grid and lots of faces. Um, everybody was getting into their role. There was a sense of urgency. And, and it really created a very powerful emotional experience. I mean, I found myself getting, you know, both stressed out and heated at various points uh, as, I, as I tried to play through my role. And, and so, yeah, I think that's an, it, those are amazing experiences. Even online, you could, you could sort of design these kind of role play scenarios. And I think that the kids love it and it's super effective. Yeah, I think I would agree with Paul that role playing is a really powerful tool. One game that comes to mind that kind of, I think, leverages that well, both within the game and outside the game, is it's a game called Quandary. 
and it, it, it makes uh, you, it's, it's a, a sci-fi colony that has to work through different crises uh, that are both social or environmental, and there's different options, and you have to convince and, and consensus build and teaches argumentation and arguing from evidence and uh, differ, differing uh, fact and opinion. But I found that it was really powerful to put students in the roles of uh, the captain, which the game does, and then have them even just explaining through why they made certain decisions through kind of a, uh, you know, um, a fa facsimile of like a after action report that you would have to do if you were, uh, you know, a, an officer in, in a colony uh, to your higher ups and students get really into it, even just justifying why they made certain decisions. Uh, so those those kind of questions that uh, around games that force you to make ethical decisions uh, because they kind of incorporate some natural role playing uh, are incredibly effective moments. Mm -hmm. I agree. The other, I saw in the chat as well, somebody had mentioned uh, Keep Talking and uh, Nobody Explodes. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a great game and, I, and it would translate well. I mean, it, it only really involves two players, but it's a game that's a lot of fun to watch, a lot of fun to participate in. And my wife's a, a second language French teacher and I've encouraged her to try to somehow use it because it, it's, it's a game that's all about communication. Uh, and it really forces you. It's much like an escape room where you, mu you must communicate in order to solve the puzzle, which is essentially diffusing a bomb. Um, some schools may be a little bit hesitant about having bombs diffused in their midst, but, uh, but it's a fairly benign game uh, and, and certainly fun to play online. The kids would love it. I've, I've used it in, in kind of public forums. We played it in, in, in our big kind of cafeteria where two people were playing and everybody was spectating and it was so much fun. So it's, uh, it's a great choice. Paul, is it possible to have three players in that game? We have, uh, we have something that we need. Um, we're in, in the Air Force. We're trying to do something for command teams. Really small team of three. We're trying to figure out how to, how to run. Could you do three? Yeah, I, don't, I can't think of how you could. It's not meant for three. And, and there might be some redesigns uh, or some mods or some, some way to, to, to play around with the rules. But essentially what you're trying to do is you're, you, you have a man, one player has a manual. Um, and the other player has the bomb. And the player who has the manual is not familiar with the manual. The player who has the bomb is not familiar with the bomb. And it's almost like they're in two separate locations. And each has to tell them what, what they're seeing. Well, one guy's frantically or one girl's frantically flipping to, to find the right part of the manual that corresponds to the right procedure that has to go on the bomb. So it's very much a two-player game. And I wonder, with a little kind of thought and creativity, I'm sure there might be a way you can weave a third person in. You can have them maybe alternate between bombs or something along those lines no actually i think it would be pretty easy uh to, to do it with three people because you could easily have two people either with two copies of the manual or you could mm. split up the manual between them so they would so there's it's always jumping around so you would never know who has the information that that is needed at that time uh and communicating it between each other would be uh, you know an added meta element uh to it that would make the game both easier and harder uh, so I think you could you could adapt it with three or even four. I think I've done it with I think I've done it with about four kids before, and they had a they had a blast. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you could really quick. I think you could actually, if depending on like the physical location and how everyone was working together, I suppose you could have one person as the communicator or the mediator between both sides. So. Mm -hmm like one person like is working with the bomb, but the person who's working with the bomb and the person who's with the manual can't actually communicate with one another yep. in whatever mm -hmm. way. And then you can have people in the middle trying to facilitate that. That might be one way, but that would depend on the you know, setup. What a, what a cool uh, design challenge. And you two have clearly risen to the occasion. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, even with the group. Is there another? And, well, Steve was talking about Paisley games or Parsley games. Sorry, Parsley games. Have you heard of those? I haven't, no. No, I can't say that I have. Okay, I, I know on the, the people who are registering, one, a couple of people have asked for games around uh, particular topics, like mm -hmm. um, math came up a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what have you done in math with games? 
I mean, we're both humanities guys, so not a lot. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's, it's funny with math, right? Because in some ways you would think that because games are so mathematical at their soul, right? They're, 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 they're numerical, you know, sort of entities, uh, particularly digital games. But it's always been a point of fascination for me that I find it probably one of the hardest subjects to integrate a game for. And I, I have to think, and it shouldn't be, right? Because one of the things that math suffers from is that it's often divorced from its practical application. Kids are right. learning all these formulas, but they have no clue when and how they could be used. And I think there's an enormous opportunity to start marrying those formulas to simulations. And, and, and so one game that comes to mind would be the Kerbal Space Program, but that's more mm. on the physics end of it, I would right. say, yeah. than, than, right. than kind of you know, pure math. Uh, for the young ages, I mean, the, the classics are the Dragon Box games uh, that mm -hmm. teach kind of algebraic thinking at a very early age. And I would say those are really, really good. Um, but there's a gap. I, I find that whenever I'm, I'm, I, I had a role at my school where I was helping other teachers integrate games in their practice, and I definitely hit a wall with the math department, um, especially with high school math, um, where, where you're really having to meet certain benchmarks and everybody's in a rush and they're trying to cram that information into the kids' heads um, as, as, efficient, as efficiently as possible. Uh, it, it just, it, it hasn't lent itself to a game. But I, but I also feel that of all subjects with the right design, there could be some absolutely brilliant games and simulations to engage kids in math in a, in a way that will make the way that we're doing it now seem so primitive and counterintuitive. Well, and you could do a lot for, with a lot around math in Minecraft. Sure. Yeah. Right. And, Steve, and Steve's the man, yeah. but yeah. Um, not that, um, you know, th not that that was my idea. That was Chris's, but um, I would, I would, I was going to say for math, uh, as Paul said, one reason why it's so hard is because it is content driven, uh, and it, it, it can be a very thin needle uh, to thread, uh, when, when you're trying to get that content in at the right time. But, uh, one thing I, if I was a math teacher, I can tell you that the idea that's always been kicking around in the back of my head would be to do an alternate reality game, like based on the Martian. Because, you know, anyone who's read that book or seen that movie, he's doing math the entire time to save his life. Uh, and I think if you took a, a similar scenario like that and created essentially, uh, you know, role playing puzzles that required math to, you know, grow potatoes or get the right air pressure in, in, in your habitat, uh, that could be a, a pretty cool thing. That might even get me to do math, mm -hmm. which would be uh pretty uh pretty big challenge because i'm an english <laughs> teacher for a reason same uh my friend chris Crowell just mentioned on the chat and he reminded us that D, D is actually a great way to do math with younger kids right where you're doing probability and uh so if you're using i mean dungeons and dragons is a is a, a fairly significant enterprise it's not something you can just pull out and play for 15 minutes in math class but if you're working with younger kids and you have kind of an integrated multidisciplinary unit um, for example i know of a case where uh, there's a study published about a teacher who taught her entire grade three year revolving around a modified Dungeons and Dragons game. And she, she taught science and math and English and everything. And, and it made perfect sense. It was perfectly cohesive narrative structure to bring the year together. And the math was handled uh, largely through the dice rolls and the probability charts and, and that type mm -hmm. of thing. So for, for the lower level math, that's an awesome idea, Chris. Thanks for reminding us of that. Well, even Another? something like Monopoly is very math. You know, right. I mean, that's very yeah. simple. Barchese. It does, you don't have to. You don't have to use a, a a video game. And some of those games, there are versions that you can play over over a web conference, Zoom or Meet or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's right. and a lot of the most popular board games, uh, as board games have uh, have kind of grown uh, in market share uh, for people's attention, uh, many of them have gone digital. So if you if you log on to uh, the Steam store and look for a certain board game, chances are there's there's probably a digital one if it's one of the more popular uh, games. So that can be an easy way to play it uh, asynchronously or uh, over a distance as we, as we might have to do now. Uh, yeah, I would love to play Gloomhaven for, for maths. Absolutely. There's tons of that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, math is tough. I, I won't lie. Math is tough. And, uh, James York, uh, our a colleague from who, who works in Japan and does a lot of amazing work around second language learning in games reminds us that also game design is very mathematical. So it's not just playing a game, but if you design a game digitally, there's an opportunity there to leverage math as well. 
And it's really not that hard now to design virtual escape rooms either, that you could build actually mm -hmm. problems around almost anything. Yeah, it's very, it's very similar to kind of basic ARG uh, puzzle creation as well. And uh, and then and you know moving to other subjects, uh, there's so many subjects that are you know there, there's kind of a, a roster of games that are typically connected to subjects. So for example, Portal Two and Kerbal Space Program to Physics. Um, I've done work with um, with with Total War in history. And what was interesting about that is we, so it, it was a, it's a pretty fascinating unit. I wrote about it in Edutopia. And what we did was we micro focused on one very, very specific historical period, which was when, when Julius Caesar started his campaign in Gaul. And what's fascinating is Julius Caesar didn't really accomplish any conquering until he was in his forties. He, and he was in a desperate situation. He owed money in Rome. He was up for corruption charges. And then, so he started his campaign in what is today France and, and parts of Germany and Switzerland um, to get away from, from these charges and to make enough money that he could go back and deal with his problems at home. So the whole unit just focused on the very, very first battle he was involved in, which was with the Helvetii, which were a, a Swiss uh, tribal group that was moving westward. And what we did is we read his accounts of the battle. It's about two or three pages in the Gallic Wars. We watched a short documentary about the battle. And then there's an expansion for Rome Total War that focuses on that particular part of the campaign. And we only played through you know, the first two or three turns of the campaign, which was about an hour worth of gameplay. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. Um, history is often looked at in a very wide kind of lens, especially at high school. And to really dig into the details of that particular battle and those particular circumstances and to study how the different mediums change the story, how Caesar's account is obviously biased because he wrote it. Uh, the documentary can give you some visual stimulation and the game gives you a sense of the strategy and the geography and all these little kind of tidbits of information. And what was amazing was having the game in front of the whole class with, and, and the game is full of information and very historically accurate. And you know, if, if a certain general would be encountered, I'd immediately say, okay, is this general somebody that Caesar did encounter, could have encountered? So they go on, they research and they say, actually, no, this guy was, you know, was, was nowhere near Caesar at this particular time. So, so one great way to use video games in history is, is, is because the challenge is if you follow the historical timeline, it's not a game anymore because you've done exactly what was done in the past. So when you have the freedom to play around with the, the kind of counterfactual history and, and, and recreate history, you may say, well, they're deviating from the historical reality. So they're not learning anything, but what they are learning are the kinds of forces uh, that, that, that shape history, the kinds of decision makings that leaders have to make. And then they could be made to think critically about what the historical event was like in the game that they played versus the depiction of the historical event in some primary source document or a textbook or something along those lines. So there's a lot of great history games, both board games and digital games. And there's a lot of opportunity for like political science and history and, and to some degree even geography. I noticed in the chat that uh, Nia, and I hope I pronounced your name right, has developed and, and, uh, Actually, there's two people, um, but Nia has developed games, um, escape room games using Google Forms, which seemed to me mm -hmm. like a really cool idea. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if Nia, you could unmute yourself, or maybe you have. Yeah, I did. And you could, and maybe you could tell us about those. So what you do the same way you would normally do a survey, but you make requirements that the answer is a specific thing. And if they type in anything other than that, you can set up the Google form to pop up a no, try again, or here's a hint. You can set up hints as well. Mm -hmm. You can send them to other pages to find information or to find documents, and then they, but they have to come back to that Google form and you can fix it so it has to be letters, it can be numbers, whatever, but they have to put it in exactly the way that you would with like a real lock box with actual locks. Mm -hmm. And the second that they undo it, you have it fixed so that what pops up is a, like I've had it so the actual lock pops up that's unlocked. So they know mm -hmm. you've done it. Okay, now you get to move to the next page. And my kids, when I did it um, last year, they loved it and they just thought it was hilarious trying to finish because I had four different groups and they were trying to figure out 
okay, how do we beat everybody else at this? And that was one of the fun things about doing it digitally, which now that we're moving into remote learning, might be a fun thing to try and do as a, as a team building activity as well. Uh, how old were the kids, by the way? High school. High school, awesome. The one they class a day that I teach is um, as an American Sign Language class with high school students. And then for the rest of the day, I push into birth to 21 classrooms and homes. Beautiful. I've, I've also, I used Google Forms uh, uh, a few months ago to create a scavenger hunt around the neighborhood, believe it or not. Similarly using those unlocks, Naya, but, but instead of, so if you got to a certain location, uh, the clue would take you to the location. You would be asked a question related to the location, like what color hat is the bear wearing in front of the restaurant? And then you would put red and then it would unlock the clue to go to the next location. So you'd walk over to the next and it worked out super well. It was really easy to design. I actually found a site that talked about creating escape rooms with Google Forms and I kind of bent what they had towards a scavenger hunt and sent it to a family in our neighborhood who wanted to do something with their kids. So, and it worked out really well. Yeah, what's great about those that type of design is when you make sure that there's no uh, false negatives where they might get the answer and then not be able to proceed. So the, the precision of, of using Google Forms in that way is really smart because when they get the right answer, they will know absolutely right away because if you, if you have a false negative, that can be one of the most damaging things uh, to, to player engagement, especially for students, where if they, if they had the right answer, but it didn't work in notifying them, uh, you, you could have significant dropout. Uh, so that's a smart way to do it. Other subjects could also, I've, I've done work with second language classes in Minecraft. Um, which has been uh, really interesting. You, the, the one thing though, so what, what we did was they were doing a unit on, um, and listen, you can do just about anything with Minecraft, right? There's no subject known to man that Minecraft can somehow nourish as, as Steve will tell you. But um, in this case, they were doing a unit on uh, endangered species. And so they, they did research in French. And then what they had to do was either build a museum for endangered species in Minecraft, build kind of a safari experience for endangered species in Minecraft. And there was a third option that escapes me. And then they have to narrate the tour of the, either the museum or the safari in French. Um, and that's good, but, but as James Yorker will probably tell you, when they're recording stuff, uh, you know, they could have scripts in front of them and it's not really testing their kind of, you know, the ideal testing site for second language. But what's interesting is, if a, you know, a good second language teacher will ensure that as they're building these experiences together in class, they're dialoguing about, about what they're doing. And the teacher would provide them with the vocabulary in advance to have these discussions around the game. So it was really successful and it was a great way to, to teach a second language. And I think video games are amazing uh, for teaching second language, which is why you should look at James York's journal where he's, uh, he's documenting these experiences. Yeah, and to go back to history real quick, uh, Assassin's Creed is a, is a huge gold mine, um, especially the ancient Egyptian one and the ancient Greece one. And an idea that I, I've been trying to get my history teacher uh, at my school to do is to do a create your own virtual tour because they, they have these this, what's called discovery modes, which allows you to uh, go through the meticulously designed historical landscape. And there's even like guided tours and there's all kinds of like monuments you can just explore and get right up in front of them and figure out more about them. And then I wanted them to uh, take something that they, that isn't included in, in the discovery mode tour and do and green screen themselves into it, giving their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, the kind of museum entry about that artifact or about that concept or idea, uh, which would be pretty easy to do with, with a simple green screen uh, and uh, uh, screen capturing the, the gameplay from discovery mode. So I wanted to do that so bad. So I think that would be fun, but haven't been able to, to, to put it together quite yet. Yeah, Discovery Tour is made for the classroom. I mean, it's, 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 it's a gift to any history teacher. If you put that in front of kids, it's basically they put the museum in situ and they do a really great job of marrying. I mean, there's room for improvement for sure, but I think it's a really noble thing that this video game company actually produced an edu educational dimension. And I should also add, I cannot talk about language, uh, second language acquisition in Minecraft without mentioning my friend Glenn Irvin. Uh, he is- uh, does, he Glenn, does, done, does, does Glenn know anything? 
I had no idea. <laughs> does Glenn, is there anything Glenn doesn't know? I mean, he sings, <laughs> he speaks many languages, he does technology. Um, so he's, he's an amazing resource. I mean, he's, he's expanded his role in his district, and now I think he's, uh, he's a technology integrator in, in, uh, in uh, Minnesota. Uh, but he did amazing, amazing work with Minecraft and second language learning. I've been to a few of his sessions, and, and he's definitely, if that's your space, he's, he's definitely somebody you're going to want to talk to. Yep. Have you... Have you done work where you've had older students design a game to teach younger students something? And so in the process, mm. have, it, have them learned extra? I haven't, but I really like that idea. It's an awesome idea, Mitch. Let's yeah. talk. Yeah, that's good. There's, um, there's an example um, from Finland where uh, they wanted the, the kids to understand the um, biology of what was going on in a park. So they had the high school kids scope out, you know, just a, a, a large 100 acre park um, and, um, and develop like a quest game for the younger kids to go through the park and, and kind of answer questions and develop, well, they were developing scenes in augmented reality, but, um, but you know, uh, they, they had to develop, a, I guess, around 15 different scenes as they walked paths on the park to it, to research different aspects about the you know the flora and fauna that existed there hmm. that yeah, was that's, that's just brilliant. one example but but it seems to me that um you know you you probably learn something best by teaching it mm -hmm. so right. if you can have the the older kids learn by creating games for the younger kids it would, it would seem like a natural I'm such a huge fan of any kind of intergenerational experience, and I think that's mm. it's a it's a great idea. It's uh, it's something I I kind of now I'm thinking I should do something like that because we're always looking for ways to connect the older students in our school to the younger students, and I think that would be maybe even for orientation, right? That they create an orientation game for the new students coming in, uh, and you know related to school history or something along those lines. But that's great. And Steve brought up a game-based learning community on Participate, and maybe Steve, you could put a link in uh, so that people could join that community because mm -hmm. um, Participate is also a great resource for getting people who are interested in games or people interested in different topics together and, and collating resources. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Mike has it. So um, I think, you know, one, one thing that's interesting is that uh, John and I, uh, we spent two years designing a game together. Uh, we didn't mm -hmm. really talk about it, but I think it's worth, it's worth throwing this out there. Um, one thing we were fast, when we realized we had this kind of common love for these, these alternate reality games, we thought, well, we've got to design one. So over two years, we, we, we slowly started putting one together and it gathered momentum. And essentially what we did is we created a cyber uh, warfare simulator where John and my students were put, you know, we had this kind of crazy rabbit hole where they thought they were in a normal class and all of it, everything shifted from underneath them. And then they were put through all these tasks by this mysterious entity. And about halfway through, two weeks into this absolutely bizarre experience, uh, they, they realized that somewhere in the world, a group of students have been put through the same kind of hoops. And the final stage of the game is they have to discover the identity and location of their counterparts. And the learning experience that we were building into this was all, you know, the privacy and surveillance and, and, and data and keeping yourself safe online and password protection and all of these kind of digital literacy issues. Um, so they, they were essentially learning about the various issues and vulnerabilities. And then we set up the game. So in the latter half, the way that you would find your opponent had to do with the debilities that they had online. So, you know, John's team won. <laughs> yep, we sure did. <laughs> the first year. And, but, and the, but only barely. Barely, barely, right. Yeah. But, uh, be, and, it, and it's just, uh, you know, because, you know, something had been left on Facebook or some kid's profile had a school uniform in it. So you realize how much of, a, of this stuff is out there. And it was a really great way to both uh, make them aware of a really underserved subject. I mean, uh, you know, the, the issues around data are so important. They're going to be so defining of the future. And they have, you know, they're not being addressed in schools in any meaningful way. Whenever I tell my students, my high school students, guys, do you know that when you've got other browser tabs open, Facebook knows what you're browsing? Well, first they tell me, sir, we're not on Facebook anymore. So that's that's good. So that, that's a, a positive. But when they were, uh, they didn't realize that Facebook minds everything on your browser, which you 
may not realize either. And these are the kind of things we should know. I mean, this is kind of, you know, um, very, very important hygiene uh, for, for the 21st century. So John and I felt very passionately about that. We developed this kind of immersive game to try to teach it. And it, I think it was pretty effective. Yeah, it was it'd be interesting, interesting to note that in both times we ran it, the, uh, the teams were able to discover the identity of the other team with only two pieces of information and two mm -hmm. pieces of rather innocuous information, uh, as, as Paul mentioned before. So that was how vulnerable their identity was, uh, you know, uh, within the real world. And you guys have blogged about this game, you know, so they could just people could just search for your, your blog, right, Paul? Yeah, Matt, I think the most cohesive thing written about it is I, I blogged about my game and John has blogged about his or individually, but we, we haven't really blogged. The reason was because a lot of the stuff we didn't want to make public because it would ruin the game for the kids in, in, in other classes. But Matt yeah. Farber wrote an article about the game for MindShift. So if you do, you know, if you key search ARG, John, Paul Fallon, Paul Darvazi, you'll, you'll find the article. Um, but we've we, we had to stagger it every two years so that there'd be no institutional memory. So they, and it worked. The kids didn't know where, where their opponents were. Because one thing is when the game starts, kids start thinking, oh, it's probably the school down the street or just another, you know, another classroom in the school. Little do they suspect that their opponents are in another country thousands of miles away, right? So that was always a bit of a, a shock to them when they realized that things were pretty real. That was a great game. You guys yeah. did a phenomenal job on that. We're ho we're hoping to do it again. We gotta. It, it's it's all. It's there's so many moving parts to it that uh, it, when it works, the moving parts are great. But it also makes it hard to to get it synced into both of our schedules. Have yeah. you heard about other ARGs used in schools? Uh, not to that same scale. Uh, I, there's, there's definitely people out there who are doing smaller scale ones and that's where like the Venn diagram between like escape rooms and alternate reality games gets to be, get a bit blurry. It's almost just how much narrative do you put on top of it uh, in, in many cases. Uh, so there's definitely people who are, who are out there uh, fighting the good fight when it comes to alternate reality games. Um, but not, not in the same way that I think Paul and I did. Mike, as I say, Mike Matera does some really amazing stuff with ARGs. Um, there's a few other, I, I, I posted a blog on my, on my largely abandoned blog site uh, about two years ago where I listed teachers that were doing stuff with ARGs and, and models. Uh, a few of those names escape me, but Mike Matera is definitely one of the go-to people in that mm -hmm. space. And I'm seeing the Good Game uh, podcast. Uh, so maybe, are, are one of you going to be on Good Game podcast soon? Uh, well, I host that with Tobias Stabi over in Norway. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we did, we had our first season, uh, and we, we just, uh, partnered up with, uh, Mike Washburn to participate, uh, to produce, uh, our, our next reboot, which will be going into a monthly format. Uh, and the, the first episode and that will be coming very soon within the next uh, month. Uh, so, uh, I, urge you guys to to subscribe to that and, and take a look at it because we'll be definitely having these types of people that have uh, that have been mentioned uh, on the podcast to talk more in depth about their uh, their successes and their challenges to game-based learning and then I know that uh, we have an, another all-star here and who's participating uh, Melissa Pilikowski who runs on Thursday nights the uh, games for ed Twitter chat and so for those of you who are interested in game-based learning, um, you, you know, at eight o'clock Eastern time, seven o'clock Central time, you can do the math. There's a, there's a math game for you um, mm -hmm. to figure out when it, when it's on in your time zone, but just go to Twitter and with the hashtag games for Ed, and she always has some really interesting questions and there's always uh, somewhere between 10 and 40 people who are uh, talking about their gaming experiences. Uh, also, I'm going to I'm going to ask for a plug. One of the dimensions of this game that I'm 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 currently designing with my students that we're going to probably start in a week is having people they don't recognize reading script parts that we send them. It's almost this disembodied voice that moves from one body to the other. So if anybody is game for being one of the people that we're going to give a script to, just fire me an email or something. Say, hey, I'd love to be one of those people. And and uh, yeah, Steve Isaac, I saw your hand go up. I was hoping. <laughs> Right. I, I've already enlisted Chris Carl. He kind of half knows that. But uh, but anybody else who wants to be in it, I, I would love uh, your help. And it'd be kind of funny to be part of this precarious event. Okay. Well, if you want my voice, I'll volunteer too. 
Awesome. That's great. And so um, we're heading up to nine o'clock. So um, maybe each of you do a quick summary of um, what you think you've either you've gotten out of the session or what you'd like to impart to some of the people who are attending. Uh, I, I just feel, I guess it's my recurrent message that the work we do in games, I, I don't, you know, one thing I think we have, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir. I see many of the names here I recognize or, or I recognize some of the faces and I know that you are game friendly people, but I actually see this work as a very important for making education a better place. Uh, I think, you know, my recurrent mantra is that the way that education works like right now needs a lot of work and perhaps one of the positive byproducts of this situation we're living through right now may be a reconsideration of some elements of education. And I would like to see a return to play, a return to, to engagement at a very genuine level and not this kind of this, all these extrinsic motivators that are dragging kids along from one thing to the next and there's no clear connection to the real world and you know so many of the things that we re all recognize could be better about schools and and I and I definitely see games as systems that could help us reconceive of the education system so I think that's the kind of big picture that that we might be aiming for yeah if there is a silver lining yeah, they, go ahead John I was say to piggyback on what Paul said I think one of the things that game-based learning uh, does that uh, traditional education uh, does not is it strips away all context and agency. And I think if we can return more of that to students and games are not the only way, but I think they are uh, certainly a very effective way to make students feel that they're more in control of their learning uh, and that their learning has a context that's more than just, you know, finding the answer that's not in the back of the book. Uh, and that is often is what drives engagement, drives really uh, uh, powerful intrinsic learning. So I, I would just hope that we could get more of that uh, to more students as much so, as we could. So what would you say, because I, I hit this all the time as I'm talking to schools, is, um, you know, games are nice. Once the kids have finished learning what I need them to learn, then I'll let them use games. What would be your response? I would say that games are, are masterful teaching uh, experiences in themselves. Uh, and that if you leverage the game the right way, you're gonna get more learning out of that than you would out of the, the, th the theater of learning that sometimes goes on in traditional education. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I, and I see some comments like that's the worst use of games. I, you know, James, I 100% I, I agree with you. It just, I thought I'd, um, it's just so frustrating to me because so many times I'm before administrators or, or, or teachers and they're saying, well, look, I just, you know, if, if we get done with the material, like we'll do games and it's like, well, wait, you don't understand the million brain was designed to learn through play. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, you know, the agency and engagement and motivation and hard work. And we're willing to do that in a game. And yet, um, there's this uh, pervasive attitude among a large group of educators and administrators that um, games are, are frivolous. And yet, you know, the things we've discussed this night, the tonight are anything but frivolous. Mm -hmm. um, they're the things that get kids to work that much harder and really learn things in depth. Yeah, it's funny. I think that history is characterized by a, ser a series of ironic reversals. And it's, and it's so crazy to me that the way that nature intended us to learn, which is play, that's nature's, nature invented play to teach. That, that, I mean, if you do the math, that's how it works. And that we've, we've stifled that in, 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 in the, you know, I guess the, the thought that we can do better with, with this kind of more mechanical system that we've devised than nature's natural way of teaching us. So it's really just tapping into the way that we were meant to learn. And I'm hoping that we're going to see a complete reversal of that trivialization of games to actually make it a foundational element of modern education. Right. And that book I'm just seeing on the chat, Reality is Broken. Great book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Well, um, thank you. You know, so, yeah, I'd, um, I'd love to do this again, uh, maybe sometime in the summer or fall, um, and, uh, or virtually when we're at the uh, Serious Play conf conference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, everybody, because I can't believe the resources that, that have been shared here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
hope to see you all online at the Serious Play Conference, at the Games for Ed Chat, in um, uh, John's podcast. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even even maybe in person, um, not that we would ever meet up at a bar, but, you know, if there happens to be a bar open, maybe mm. some of us can meet up at a bar sometime. That'd be so, fun. That'd be uh, ideal. Someday. Thanks, thanks for having us, Mitch. It's such a pleasure. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and people that I admire so much being here. And it's always mm. a pleasure to spend any time with my dear friend, John Fallon. So awesome. Thank you. Okay. Back at you, bud. All right. Good night for EdChat Interactive and uh, hope to see you all at a future event. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good night.